Irish guys go up there in the bar. Get our film yet this morning? Did we get our film yet? Okay. He's not doing that. Okay. Oh, it's time for the film. Okay. Oh, the. Oh, I'm oh. sorry. I didn't see it. I didn't see it. <laughs> doing this morning it is so nice to have everyone online and everyone here worshiping with us this morning let's just praise the Lord this morning as we pour out ourselves in song and listen to what God pours out through Pastor Andy 
And this week, as we go about our week, please remember to pray for all of those that are um, not feeling well, that are sick, or maybe in the hospital. Just lift them up. Um, if you don't know who that might be, then just lift up your prayers to God, because guess what? He already knows. And don't forget that we have a Vacation Bible School coming up. And on that note, Jennifer would like to have a Vacation Bible School meeting for anyone willing to help in any way. And probably as in years past, that means showing up or helping make things in advance. So if you can donate any time or resources to help Jennifer pull off Vacation Bible School for our church and our community, then right after Wednesday night service this week, we're going to stay and have a meeting. So y'all put that on your calendar, okay? Okay, let's all go to the Lord with a word of prayer. Father God, we just love you so much. We just thank you for all that you're doing for us in the background, Lord. Thank you for the protection, and uh, thank you for um, tarrying with us, Lord, in this lost and dying world as we work to bring loved ones to Christ and share your word to a lost and dying world, Father. Your, your desire is that none should perish, but that all should come to know you, Father. And please help us to be a light in your hands and feet in those situations. And give us just a deep desire to go out into this world and, and uh, throw off, stay at home, um, boundaries that we've had in place for so long that Satan just wanted to tie us down with, Father, and build us up to go safely out into a world and spread your word and be your hands and feet. And I just thank you for the opportunity to come this morning and to love on you like you love on us. Father, please just touch every heart with the need that it has in it this morning and help us to respond appropriately. I thank you for all that you are and all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, church. It is so good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. Listen, uh, while I was getting ready this morning for church, man, the Lord laid some scripture on my heart, and it was so heavy that, you know, I came to church, we did rehearsal, and I was over there like frantic trying to get to the scripture because I knew that if I didn't share this, one, I would be upset with myself, and two, the Lord would be upset with me. And um, so I just want to talk to you a minute. Um, about something very, very important here. Let me get back to my, where I highlighted it. I want to share some scripture with you from uh, John chapter 11, uh, starting in verse uh, 1. This is a story about Lazarus, and I believe after I continue reading, you'll kind of see where the Lord has done a work here in this place and he's doing the work here in this place and I know that this is for every single one of us uh, John chapter 11 a man named Lazarus was sick he lived in Bethany with his sisters Mary and Martha now this is the Mary this is very important this is the Mary who later poured the expensive perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped with her hair but I want you to understand why she did that her brother Lazarus was sick and so the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. But when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus's sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. This is important here in verse 5. So, although Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. Has anyone ever needed God to move and he waited to move until a couple of days later, a couple of weeks later, a couple of months later, a couple of years later? Guys, our timetable is not God's timetable. It's all done for his glory. So although Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, so he opens with this, I love you. Jesus sees you. He loves you. He knows what you're going through. He stayed where he was for the next two days. Finally, he said to the disciples, let's go back to Judea. And then down in verse 20, when Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she rushed, she went to meet him, she rushed to meet him. But Mary, Mary, the other sister, stayed in the house. Mary was upset. God didn't move when Mary wanted God to move. But even now, 
Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Let me uh, go back to verse 21. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. So at this point, Lazarus is dead. If only you would have been here, my brother would not have died. And then, of course, we know, um, we know what goes on. And she says, but, but even still, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. I know that God will give you whatever you ask. You're too late. My, my, my brother's dead. But I know that if, I, if you ask it, that God will give it to you. And then down in verse 32, when Mary arrived and saw Jesus, this was some time later after they had, had uh, uh, Mary finally came out of the house to see him. When Mary finally arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. Of course, we know the story and we know what happens next. Jesus goes on and he raises Lazarus from the dead. But the important part is what happens in the next chapter in John chapter 12 in verse 1 Jesus is anointed by Mary the sister who was angry the sister who was mad the sister who didn't understand the sister who said God you didn't show up when I needed you but God said it's done for my glory in verse 3 Mary took a 12 ounce jar of expensive perfume and we can't hardly wrap our minds around this because that's not like we, they could just go to the store and buy perfume the way that we can she poured out an expensive, some expensive perfume and she made an essence of nard and anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance. The house was filled with the fragrance. Guys, Jesus broke Mary in that moment. She wept. She wiped Jesus' feet with expensive perfume and her tears and her hair. So I know that our church has, has been going through a lot and... and I was really scared to actually share that message, but there was no way I could not. I want you guys to know, before you walked in the door today, you were prayed for. Every one of you. I laid in bed last night, prayed out loud with my wife. She's not here this morning, but I laid in bed last night, prayed out loud with my wife for every single one of you. Wednesday night at church, we prayed out loud here for every single one of you. You're here not by accident, not because you chose, but because of divine intervention. Amen. It's time to make things spiritual again. It's done for the glory of God. And we got some big songs. I'm going to try to get through this without crying because I'm a crybaby. Thank you, Lord. Hand your heart. But listen, even, even the ones that are tuning in with us virtually, you're prayed for. If you can't make it here, you're prayed for. God is ready to move again in this place. He's ready to move in your life. And if you don't think he's doing it on your timetable, wait upon the Lord. He's going to move. No matter what it looks like, even if we understand his plans, we, we, can't, we can't fathom the, the big picture. Don't worship the Lord for what he does in your life. Worship him for who he is, the way, that, the way that God broke Mary. Mary was prepared to worship Jesus if she did, if he showed up when she said to show up, yet God showed up two days later. He broke her in that moment, and she worshiped him for who he was in that moment. So with these next few songs, guys, we're singing Soul on Fire and Raise a Hallelujah, and especially Raise a Hallelujah, no matter what you're going through, worship God through it all because He will see you through. He will see you through. And these are not my words. Father, less of me and more of you, God. I just want to pray over this church this morning, Lord. Move in a powerful way, Lord. Send your Holy Spirit down on this place and sweep across the room just like the fragrance of the perfume that Mary adorned Jesus' feet with, God. Father, we welcome you here this morning. Father, cleanse our hearts. Help us to worship you for who you are and not what you do in our lives because our minds can't understand. For those who may not ever catch a break in life, they would never see a reason to worship you. But God, you say, I am. God, you are worthy to be praised. And help us to remember that this morning, Lord. Father, we love you so much as we continue to lift up your name in, in praise this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> I'm running for your heart, I'm running. 
burning for your heart Till I am a soul on fire Lord, I'm longing for your ways I'm waiting for the day When I am a soul on fire Till I am a soul on fire God, I'm running for your heart I'm running for your heart Till I am a soul on fire Lord, I'm longing for your ways I'm waiting for the day When I am a soul on fire Till I am a soul on fire Lord, restore the joy Hallelujah With every 
in the middle of the mystery I raise a hallelujah Fear you lost your hold on me I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm church the lord be with you i know you've been standing for a minute but if you would out of respect for the reading of god's word for our gospel lesson this morning if you would remain standing for our reading from mark chapter 3 beginning in verse 20 hear these words jesus entered a house a crowd gathered again so that it was impossible for him and his followers even to eat when his family heard what was happening they came to take control of him they were saying he's out of his mind the legal experts came down from Jerusalem. Over and over they charged. He's possessed by Beelzebub. He throws out demons with the authority of the ruler of demons. When Jesus called them together, he spoke to them in a parable. How can Satan throw out Satan? A kingdom involved in civil war will collapse, and a house torn apart by divisions will collapse. If Satan rebels against himself and is divided, then he can't endure. He's done for. Everybody say, done for. Done for. No one gets into the house of a strong person and steals anything without first tying up the strong person. 
Only then can the house be burglarized. I assure you that human beings will be forgiven for everything, for all sins and insults of every kind. But whoever insults the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. That person is guilty of a sin with consequences that last forever. He said this because the legal experts were saying he's possessed by an evil spirit. Don't call the Holy Spirit evil, church. His mother and brothers arrived. They stood outside and sent word to him, calling for him. A crowd was seated around Jesus, and those sent to him said, Look, your mother, brothers, and sisters are outside looking for you. Jesus replied, Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Looking around at those seated around him in a circle, he said, Look, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother, sister, and mother. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Congregation, you may be seated during our song of preparation in which we prepare our hearts to receive the preached word.
Much thanks to our worship team. The, the worship has already been rich this morning. And for that, we are grateful. The Holy Spirit is indeed moving in this place this morning. And that is a powerful thing, because as you'll see in our text today, the Holy Spirit plays a very important role, because that's what filled Jesus. And Jesus is in the midst of some really tough ministry. He's redefining things. He's redrawing lines. And throughout history, uh, we've heard and learned over and over that when the lines establishing who's in and who's out have been drawn, anyone that steps outside of those lines is in danger. They are in trouble. Eyebrows are going to get raised. People are going to get mad. And sometimes it results in violence. An example of this, there's uh, about three short examples I want to present to you today. The first one is Martin Luther. You all know Martin Luther. In 1517, Martin Luther kicked off the Protestant Reformation, right? He was pushing back against the teachings of the church. They had established who was in and who was out, and they said you could buy purchase indulgences so that you could be back in. Essentially, the church was taking money instead of requiring repentance. Martin Luther said, no, 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 this cannot work this way. And so, in 1517, he famously nailed his 95 theses to the church castle door in Wittenberg, Germany, and all he wanted to do was start a debate. Let's get together, let's debate, let's talk about this, but sometimes the people of God don't really understand the art of dialogue too well. He wanted a dialogue, and what he got was a full-blown revolution that got him excommunicated from the church he loved and served and even taught for, and it almost cost him his life. When the lines regarding who's in and who's out have been drawn, and you step outside of those lines, it's going to be pretty dangerous. Things are going to happen. The next example I want to bring before you is a gentleman named Diedrich Bonhoeffer. Diedrich Bonhoeffer was a German scholar, pastor, and professor. During his ministry, he pushed back against Hitler and the Nazi regime. And because of his anti-Nazi ways, because he pushed back and he said, no, the circle is so much wider than what you are trying to make it, it was forbidden for him to teach and speak publicly and even release any public writings. His anti-Nazi ways and his redrawing of lines between who's in and who's out eventually landed him on Adolf Hitler's most wanted list. He was detained and he was executed shortly before the fall of the Nazi regime. When the lines dividing who's in and who's out have been drawn, when you step outside of those lines, trouble is on the way. Last example of this from our own country. We've looked at two fine individuals that came to us from Germany. Now we're going to look at our own country. And we're going to look in the south, and we're going to look to Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr., who pushed back against racism, social injustice, social inequality. And Dr. King's resistance, though it was nonviolent, pushed back against who was in and who was out, against those lines that existed there. And his nonviolent resistance landed him in jail. It saw him beaten on several occasions and eventually cost him his life as he was shot in Memphis, Tennessee. History is full of resistance stories. And resistance is hard. But sometimes the line between who's in and who's out needs to be redrawn. Jesus, in Mark's gospel, has come out of the gate swinging, redrawing the line between who is in and who is out. He's doing so in a big way. Y'all, we're just in chapter 3 of Mark's gospel. We're not even a quarter of the way through Mark's telling of the good news. And already, Jesus has rocked the boat by doing such things as casting out evil spirits. He has preached 
throughout Galilee. He's healed a man with skin disease. You don't touch people like that, especially in the ancient world. He healed a paralytic man as his friends lowered him down through the roof. And then he even offered this individual forgiveness of sins, something only God does. And that got the attention of the religious leaders. They said, no, no, God, only God can do that. And Jesus pushed back publicly against them in that particular instance. Jesus has sat down and eaten with sinners. He's healed a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath. Such a stir that he created that the Pharisees and supporters of Herod to this point at the beginning of chapter 3 were plotting to destroy Jesus. And while one group who was thought to be the insiders, plotted to destroy Jesus. The outsiders were becoming so numerous and following Jesus and seeking him out that Jesus and his friends could not even enter a house to sit down and eat a meal. Jesus is pushing back against the social order, against the religious order of his day. He's literally defining who are the insiders and who are the outsiders. And for Jesus, the religious elite and the political elite, who were supposed to be the insiders, the religious elite were supposed to be God's very own insiders. And instead, Jesus, in a public fashion, reveals to them that they have now, in the eyes of God, become the outsiders. Ciders. And shaking things up like this is bound to cause trouble, church. Jesus' family understands that Jesus is rocking the boat and he is in danger. And that's where our text begins today. Now, a typical um, happening in Mark's gospel, Mark writes this way, he will start out with a story, he won't finish that story, he will insert another story, which ties into the main story, then he will finish the story he started and tie them all together. You can think of it as kind of a Markin sandwich or like an Oreo cookie if you prefer. I like Oreos. So you have a story that starts, you have the interior which, uh, which further builds upon the story that has started and then Jesus offers a finishing touch on that. So the first part of this story sandwich, if you will, involves Jesus' family. Jesus is shaking things up, and if Jesus shakes them up so much, it will bring great shame upon... It won't just have bad repercussions for Jesus. It'll bring shame upon the family, and they can be excommunicated from the synagogue. And in the ancient time, to be excommunicated from your tribe, to be cast out from your tribe, was absolutely devastating. You had to have your tribe around you. It was horrible circumstances. It literally took a community, a village, to raise people up. You typically hired within your tribe. If you actually hired to a higher tribe with higher social standing, that was a gift. That didn't happen very much. The importance of your tribe and your peers was absolutely vital. And Jesus is about to get his family kicked right out of their tribe. So they are on their way, as the text says, they're on their way to put Jesus back in line because he's lost his mind. That sets the stage. Then Mark takes the camera, takes it off of Jesus' family, who are heading straight toward the house where Jesus is in Capernaum. Then the scene shifts. And it shifts to the big dogs. The religious leaders, the Pharisees at this point, who have come down from Jerusalem. Y'all, they've come down from the big church. And they've come to set this little country-dwelling, traveling, itinerant preacher in order because he's messing things up. But notice where they are when we find them in the text. It says, Jesus sat down to eat, but the crowds were so great that he and his friends were in a house and they could not even sit down to eat. And then it says that the Pharisees issued a charge over and over. He's casting out demons in the name of Beelzebub. And then did you catch what happens after that? It said, Jesus called them forward because they were physically on the outside. And Jesus brings them in, and he's about to redefine who is on the inside and who is on the outside. You see, Jesus could not let such an accusation of summoning dark spirits in order to cast out demons go unchecked, because that not only would get you excommunicated, that could get you executed. 
So Jesus is going to put this straight. He calls them in and he chooses to use proverbial language. He's going to use rhetoric in which he is going to make their claim look so ridiculous that you absolutely cannot believe that there's any validity to their claim. Jesus says this to them basically. How can Satan throw out Satan? How, tell me how that works. Because if Satan wants to retain control over anything, Satan has to work in concert with his demons, right? Satan's got to do stuff according to his, his own army. A rogue demon then would in fact weaken the attack and it could bring Satan's plan coming down completely. How absurd. How ridiculous. It absolutely cannot be this way. And then he goes on to say, in fact, if one, Satan, wants to attack something bigger than Satan, Jesus, then the weaker has to tie up the stronger. Because if you don't tie up the stronger, as Jesus said, you are done for. Satan does not stand a chance. Not only does Jesus disprove their claim, but Jesus then lets them know that he is far greater than any evil power that they can choose to accuse him with. And then Jesus goes a little bit further. Because Jesus is greater than any evil power that could come against him because he is filled with God's good and gracious and powerful Holy Spirit. And Jesus says, you accuse me of blasphemy. You accuse me of summoning dark spirits. I accuse you of blasphemy because you call what I have an evil spirit and it is the very spirit of God which is at work within me which is going to change this world which is going to break every shackle of evil and slavery and sin for God's people and in fact if you do not get on board with what's going on with the Holy Spirit you are guilty of blasphemy and that has eternal consequences mm, and we are left in the tension of that moment. And then Mark takes the camera and puts it back on Jesus' family. Jesus is pushing back hard. He has declared that these religious big dogs from the church in Jerusalem are now not insiders, but they are outsiders. And so then this begs the question, if they are the outsiders, then who are the insiders? Because we don't want to be those that have eternal consequences of judgment, do we? So now we got to find a way to get on the right path. And Jesus says, I got something for you here. Then Mark takes the camera, puts it back on Jesus' family, and they arrive to get him under control, right? He's lost his mind. And they say, Jesus, your mother and your brothers are here. And he says, hold up. Let's talk about this insider and outsider situation. Who are my mother and my brothers? Who do you think are the insiders? I've just told you that the ones that claim to be insiders are outsiders. Now let's talk about who actually is the insider. And Jesus says, you know who the insider is? Whoever does God's will. Whoever does God's will is my brother, my sister, and my mother. You see, to be an insider with Jesus, it's not about bloodline, it's not about title, it's not about social standing, cleanliness, worthiness, skin color, or any other sort of human division or social caste system that we have made and put in place. It's about doing God's will and pushing back against any and all forms of evil and slavery that exist in this world because that is not how God intended for things to be. And a mission statement such as that, which Jesus is full force going after today, will no doubt raise some eyebrows and create a bit of tension as it did in his day. You see, resistance is hard, but sometimes the line between who's in and who's out needs to be redrawn because we have missed the mark and we have got it wrong. i got to confess to you, we're going to spend a little bit of time in Mark's gospel moving forward, and I'm going to let you know something out of the gate. The Jesus that we find in Mark's gospel ain't no teddy bear Jesus. 
I know sometimes we want a teddy bear Jesus, one who's soft and cute and cuddly, and there are times in our lives when we need those, and most of the time we pull that stuff out of John's gospel because John has a really high Christology, and when you're talking about the divinity of, of Jesus, you talk about the all-knowingness and the, the, the intellect of Jesus, which was above everything else. We take comfort in the fact that Jesus is wholly other than us. In Mark's gospel, Jesus gets in the dirt with folks, and he has hard conversations, and he puts them in their place and he does not mince words, and he thus puts us in our place, and he will wear us out. But thanks be to God for that. He's no teddy bear. We want a soft and cuddly Jesus, and yes, I will confess to you that in Mark's gospel, the Jesus that we find is still full of love, still full of grace, and still full of of forgiveness, but he is also a powerful leader, the powerful leader of a revolution. A revolution that calls evil, all forms of evil, into account and that refuses to sit idly by. we got to pay attention to that, church, because we're okay at looking at evil, at calling out evil. But in Mark's gospel, Jesus calls you and me and us and the church to do something about the evil and the slavery that exists around us in any and all forms. And Jesus refuses to sit idly by, letting evil have its way in the world. And anyone who endorses that form of evil, that accepts that kind of evil, or even turns a blind eye to that evil. Lord, have mercy. Anybody getting their toes stepped on right this minute other than me? Anyone who accepts that kind of evil, who endorses it or turns a blind eye to it, according to the Jesus that we find in Mark's gospel, are no better than the Pharisees, and they are therefore outsiders. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be an outsider of Jesus Christ. I want to be an insider with Jesus Christ. And to be an insider of Jesus Christ in his ministry, it flips everything upside down. He calls the ones who should be insiders outsiders, and then those who are outside, you know, the broken. Anybody broken? The bruised. Anybody bruised here this morning? The imperfect. Hello. The forgotten. Those who are rough around the edges. Those with no status. The unclean. The foreigner and even the sinners. Anybody who does God's will can become an insider with Jesus Christ. That is good news. This redrew the lines of who's in and who's out completely. It changed the fabric of society in Jesus' day, and it changed the religious life. No wonder the Pharisees and the supporters of Herod wanted to destroy Jesus. And make no mistake, church, I once had a seminary professor say, you can't end a sermon without going by way of the cross. We're going to go by way of the cross here for just a second. They seek to destroy Jesus. And they're soon going to find out that not even death on a cross can stop Jesus or his insiders. Resistance is hard. But sometimes the lines between who's in and who's out need to be redrawn. Jesus was intent on doing this. And as United Methodists, we should be intent on doing this as well. I don't know about you, I am proud to be a United Methodist. I'm United Methodist by choice. I wasn't raised United Methodist. But I found the United Methodist Church and John Wesley's understanding of grace, responsible grace, provenient sanctifying, justifying, and glorifying grace. Grace that works within us, that grows throughout our life, but yet grace that requires our responsibility and our growth and our maturation. And I said, I have found my people. 
And then as I dug deeper into our literature, I further found that this is my people because in our social principles, we say things like what's about to appear on the screen. And this reminds me that Jesus had conversations about redrawing the lines between who's in and who's out and who's an insider, who's an outsider, because he wanted to make a difference and break chains in his world. And we want to do the same because we will not stand in the face of evil, church. That's not who we are. And we make statements like this as United Methodists. That we affirm that all people are individuals of sacred worth created in the image of God. All persons need the ministry of the church in their struggle for human fulfillment. We will seek to live together in Christian community, welcoming, forgiving, and loving one another as Christ has loved and accepted us. We commit ourselves to be in ministry for and with all persons. That sounds a lot like the ministry Jesus was engaged in on that day in Capernaum when he redrew the lines of who's in and who's out. Jesus was saying that all people are important to him. More than simply being kept in line by the religious and the social elite of that day, Jesus was telling those who are inside and outside that people don't need to be kept in line. They need grace. They need love. And they need a community. And that those who follow Jesus not only do so in word, but also in deed, because we commit ourselves to being in ministry with all people. Because when we commit to this, we are in fact doing God's will. Make no mistake, in our 21st century culture, when we talk about being in ministry for and with all people, it's going to raise some eyebrows. You mean you minister to those people? Why do you do that? How much money are they going to put back into your church? Why do you want to associate here when you have other opportunities here? It will raise eyebrows. It will turn some heads. But once we redraw those lines and we welcome the outsiders in and we treat them as insiders, we will be following the ministry of our challenging and loving Christ. Resistance is hard, church. But sometimes the line between who's in and who's out needs to be redrawn. Let us be faithful in following Jesus into the ministry of redrawing lines between who's in and who's out. If you commit to being in ministry for and with all people, you might just find that those who seem different aren't quite so different than you after all. I've learned that in a lot of instances it's really hard to hate somebody you've tried to get to know. And if you try to get to know them in the name of Jesus Christ, I promise you the Holy Spirit will be at work and the Holy Spirit will make changes as changes need to be made. Not your job to fix other people. That's the Holy Spirit's job. It's our job to love them and to welcome them and to offer them Christ, as John Wesley said. May we, the folks of Pleasant Hill United Methodist Church, be known as a people who do God's will. When people talk about Pleasant Hill, I would love for them to say, they're a church that does God's will. They will stop at nothing to do God's will. They're bringing God's kingdom to earth as it is in heaven. That's what I want to hear. That's the church I want to be a part of. And may we be known as Jesus' brothers, sisters, and mother. May we redraw the lines of acceptance and grace so that all people who come through our doors come through our doors as insiders, 
not outsiders. That when they come through our doors, they are welcome, they are loved, and they know that in this place, regardless, forgiveness awaits them. Amen. Jesus' ministry is hard ministry, church. There's no, there's no bones about it. There's no way around it. It's hard. It's challenging. Sometimes it causes us to have conversations, difficult conversations. Sometimes we have to listen to junk we don't want to listen to and then process what the validity of it is and wonder how people got there in the first place. It's hard ministry. It requires a lot of us. It requires intentionality and it requires grace. I don't know about you, sometimes my grace runs thin. Thankfully, Jesus gave us a meal that fills us with grace, that reunifies us as the body of Christ. Because did you hear what I said a little bit earlier? People need love, they need grace, and they need community. We are about to celebrate the meal that re-dash members us as the community of Jesus Christ. If you haven't got your prepackaged communion elements, go ahead and travel now. They're, they're right by the door. Let me offer the invitation to the table. This is the Lord's table. This is not a United Methodist table. If you say yes to this invitation, you're welcome to join us in the feast. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Church, knowing that we have not fully lived into this invitation, let us do our due diligence to pause and confess silently our sins before God. Then I will lead us in a corporate prayer of confession and pardon. Won't you please pray with me? Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We've not done your will. We've broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we've not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, church, we have all been forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. All who are able, let us affirm our faith in the glorious God who has just offered us forgiveness for all of our sins. All who are able, please stand and let's join together in our affirmation of faith. Christian, what do you believe? We believe in God the Father, the Almighty. We believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the giver of life. We believe in the three in one. Amen. You may be seated. Let's lift up our hearts and give thanks to God. Blessed are you, God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When our love failed and we turned away, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. In the fullness of time, you sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Lord and Savior. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave thanks to you. He broke the bread. He gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you. He gave the cup to his disciples and he said, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, do it to remember me. 
And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving in union with Christ's offering for us. Pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered here, near and far. That we may go forth into the world to be the body of Christ redeemed by His blood. Pour out your Spirit on these elements of bread and wine and make them be for us the body and blood of Christ. By your Holy Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast together forever at His heavenly banquet. And together the people of God said, Amen. The body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. Thanks be to God. Amen. At this time, if the praise band would make their way up to the stage for our closing song, as the band plays, if there are some lines in your life and some lines in your theology and some lines in your thinking and some lines wherever, I don't know. Church, I don't preach an agenda. I just preach the gospel and I want the Holy Spirit to work in each of your lives. So whatever the Holy Spirit is telling you today, I want you to follow the Holy Spirit's path and the Holy Spirit's prompting. And whatever the Holy Spirit is telling you, you need to redraw redraw it and follow Jesus more fully whatever that looks like for you I'm not telling you how that should look but I am telling you however it looks you need to be faithful as the band plays our closing song and we're reminded of how much God loves us if there's anything in your life that needs to be redrawn the altar is open for you come and pray if you would like for me to pray with you, just slip up your hand and I'll be happy to come pray with you about anything you would like. Otherwise, I'm going to give you this time to wrestle with God so that God can redraw some lines in our lives that may be a little out of place. Amen. for me Love's like a hurricane I am a tree Bending beneath The weight of His wind and mercy When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions Eclipsed by glory And I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me and oh how he loves us so oh how he loves us how he loves us
And oh, how he loves us all. Oh, how he loves us. How he loves us all. He loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. And we are his portion, and he is our prize. Drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes. If grace is an ocean we're, we're all, all sinking so heaven meets earth like an unforeseen kiss and my heart turns violently inside of my chest and i don't have time to maintain these regrets when i think about the way he loves us oh how he loves us oh how he loves us oh how he loves yeah he loves us oh For receiving the benediction. Be reminded that we have giving baskets here on the altar table, and if you would like to contribute to the mission and ministry of Pleasant Hill United Methodist Church, uh, your financial contributions would be appreciated. We give not out of obligation, but out of grateful and joyful hearts, because God has first blessed us. Thank you, church. We celebrate you for your faithfulness, your faithful and generous giving. Um, you are making a difference. As well, the basket over here on top of the subwoofer has a special, special meaning. If you would like to contribute to a love offering for Matthew Kelly and his family and uh, their expenses for various things, um, most of us here know, know the scenario. I'm not going to go into it as we are being broadcast over the World Wide Web. If you know, then you know. If you don't, come and ask. But if you'd like to contribute to a love offering for that family, that basket is for them. Thank you for being generous and giving and loving on one of your own who desperately needs it at this time. Church, receive the benediction. Resistance is hard, but sometimes the line between who's in and who's out need to be redrawn. This week, think of someone or a group of people who you consider to be outsiders and consider adjusting your perspective by not simply seeing them as outsiders, but as people of sacred worth. As you go into the world to love and serve God, go knowing that the love of God, the grace of Jesus, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with each and every one of us. That's good news. We're not doing the hard work of ministry alone. The Spirit is filling us and empowering us. And we celebrate and go forth to serve by saying, Amen.